two-week series today is all about spiritual health, how to maximize spiritual health. Starting today, we're going to talk about the mind. Next week, we're going to talk about the heart. And so we're going to discover and, and really lean into what we're thinking about. I would call this probably a classic science of mind message because we're really going to explore our founder, Ernest Holmes, and many other ancient traditions and the relationship to the mind. And it's pretty simple, as Barry sang, what we're thinking about is creating the scenes of our life is manifesting in the world. But before we go to that part, I really want to invite us to take a look at how our founder, Ernest Holmes, talks about mind, to represence ourselves to mind as, as Dr. Patty read, as the presence that is everywhere in everything. When Holmes would write about mind, if you read him at all, he would often capitalize the M in mind when he was speaking about the mind of the universe, the mind that is God, the mind that is the infinite. And when he was talking and referring to the human experience of mind, he would often write in a lowercase m, the mind of our human experience. And so he says a lot about this as an invitation to claim and own our place in mind and as a mind expressing in the mind that God is. His theory, our theory, is that this mind that is God is everywhere present. That it, our creation idea is that it created everything out of itself. It had nothing else to create anything from, so it created all that is out of itself, and therefore everything, every person, every object, every experience, every being, every tree, every flower is imbued with the same energy of the divine everywhere. And this actually... Uh, jives with what physics has told us, that our universe is a universe made of energy, that everywhere that same energy is expressing itself through all of creation, but it uniquely expresses as an iPad or as a person or as a, a, a cloud floating by, that it's all uniquely expressed, but when you take it down to the molecular level, it's still all the same thing, energy. And if Holmes were alive today, he would say it's still all the same thing, mind, capital M. It's still all the same thing, God. That's our definition of God, of what source is, and that we are all co-creators in that mind. Holmes has many quotes about this, but I'd like to share one with you this, to, this morning. He says, and he, by the way, he wrote in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and so his language is not always very gender inclusive. And so we keep the language the way it is when we quote it, but I would change it if I were uh, queen of the world. I would probably shift it a little bit to be more gender inclusive, and I do change it in my little books when I read it, but here's this quote. To believe in God effectively means much more than simply asserting that you believe in a power greater than yourself. The presence of God to you must be an inner experience, a spiritual conviction that is real. You must know that God is right where you are and not separate from you. Every time your heart beats, it is responding to an infinite rhythm no man or person has ever fathomed. Every time you think, you are thinking creatively because your mind is one with the creative spirit. And in his writing, he capitalized this next part for emphasis. He says, out of the mind of God, you were created as a divine being. And as a divine being, you must recognize and know the source of that which created you out of itself, the creative spirit of God Almighty. So my first call to us is to remember and to re recognize that we are saying in this teaching that God is mind and mind is God. All that is, is God and all that is, is the mind of God. And we exist in it as co-creative energies for we believe that this presence imbued us with the co-creative energy 
that God is, that the mind of God is our mind, that we are always in touch with it, that there's something within it that is always expressing through it, through us as it, that we are creating from it. We are creating the scenes of our life individually and collectively that allows for life on planet earth to occur. That we are connected in the oneness of it, that divine mind at the core of us, and we are connected in the diversity of it as we are a unique expression of it. That we are uh, experiencing the mind of God and we also are experiencing the, the uniqueness that is us that might be called the ego self or the unique self. I don't believe that the goal of our human experience is to have an egoectomy, to release ourselves of our, our individual experience of ourselves such that we merge into the one and have no distinction. I think being on the planet, that part of the evolutionary journey is can I live in the paradox? Can I live in both the reality that I am the oneness and I am the diversity. That I live and have access to the all that is while I uniquely specialize it in my experience and contribute to the experience that humans are having on the planet. That it's both and, both and. And that a healthy spiritual being stops abdicating their power with regards to their own life and with regards to the contribution they are constantly making to the experience of humanity. That we're not some little islands isolated over here in a corner and our life is just happening to us. That we're not little islands over in a corner and there's just stuff going on out there that has nothing to do with me that all of us have our unique experience and our unique journey and all of us are connected to the all of it and can influence and can participate in the collective journey that's occurring. And those of us who refuse to abdicate our power and say, I know who I am, and I know the truth about my essence, I know the truth about the contribution that I can make, and I'm gonna stand in my power, and I'm going to make a contribution, and I'm gonna live my life from that place, find ourselves more connected and grounded in the truth of who we are. Yes, yes. Now we have to also understand in this, when we start to explore the mind that is our unique experience, the greatest challenge is that the word mind for humans includes all the thoughts, the beliefs, the emotions, the feelings and experiences we've had. And the greatest challenge for us as human beings is we actually think we know what we think. Right? We're pretty arrogant about it sometimes. I know what I think. When all the while something else is happening altogether right out there. And so we understand from the way that the brain works. Brain science has absolutely confirmed for us that there is this conscious mind that we have, which is a small portion of our daily life that shows us what we think. But the big, vast expanse of it is the deeper mind, the memories that are stored in deeper memory. I mean, I know I've had the experience of someone coming to me and saying, you know, when you were three years old, you threw that ball through the window and it crashed through our window and it broke it. And I'm thinking, I don't remember that at all. But everybody around me, all the adults around me, remember that memory. That, did I, 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 I did it. I'm sure I did it. It's in deeper memory. It's not useful to me right now. But if I have guilt about it, or I was shamed about it, or I felt embarrassed about it, now that might be affecting me, right? That might be something that's running the show. And so I pay attention and I do my work to, to, fall into and take ownership of the deeper mind. And when we're talking about the mind, we're often talking about uh, in classes and in Barry's wonderful songs and even today, our mind being like this garden. And we're always growing a garden. We're always planting seeds. We're like sowing seeds constantly of our thoughts that arise up from that that surface mind and from the deeper mind and we're constantly planting seeds and some of the things in our garden are weeds we had a very interesting debate in the green room about what is a weed really 
we decided that a weed is in the eye of the beholder, I think is what we came to ultimately. Because sunflowers, my husband tells me, are technically weeds and he adores sunflowers and they are choking out the grass in our front yard and we don't care. <laughs> but there might be weeds that we don't want to be growing in our garden or certain kinds of plants or flowers that just don't suit us. And then our work becomes to garden and, and pay attention and get present to our own garden and say, I've got to do something about this. Many people think that we do this just for ourselves, but here's the thing, that when we're talking about mind, the capital M, we all are gardeners and co-creators of our own experience, but it's like we're in a co-op with humanity, right? And your garden affects my garden, and your garden affects my garden, and your garden affects, and the seed you grow in your garden flies off and plants over in my garden, and we all are impacting each other's garden. So we can't just afford to go into this isolated place, I'm just going to tend to my garden. We have to understand that every part of this process is for the sake of ourselves and for all of humanity, and that we are constantly, constantly planting seeds because we are constantly thinking, thinking, thinking every moment of the day. And even at night when we sleep, we're constantly thinking, aren't we? I can raise my hand right now and say, hi, my name is Michelle and I'm an addictive thinker. Hi, Thank you, hi, Michelle, yes. Maybe we should start that group. That group might be good. <laughs> so a spiritually healthy person works to understand that to change my life, to change the world, I have to do something that we say a lot around here. I have to change my thinking to change my life. I have to change my perspective. I have to change my garden to change my life. I have to take responsibility and accountability for my own garden so that I can begin to grow what it is that I would really like to see not only in my life, but in the world. That I don't have the luxury of standing over and feeding and nurturing uh, resentment plants constantly and thinking I'm gonna have a different experience. It doesn't work like that. Any more than if I plant carrots that the garden's gonna grow broccoli for me. It doesn't have the capacity. The mind says, oh my beloved, grow whatever kind of garden you want. You want a resentment garden? Go at it. You can have the biggest resentment, anger garden you want. Have fun. But will we be happy? Not necessarily. And so the capacity to change our minds is powerful and profound. I've got a couple things that I'm bringing from social media this week to us. And uh, I was scrolling through internet and Jennifer Burnett and I are friends. And she posted something really powerful on her page one day. And she said, I want to share a gratitude today. I'm grateful for my open mind. It has given me the opportunity to change my opinion about things, to change my mind. It's a simple thing to be grateful for, but it's also incredibly powerful. So our capacity to change our minds, to remain open as we feel ourselves constantly looking out and drawing conclusions and coming to decisions about people and things is huge. And in cognitive therapy, there's all sorts of methodologies for helping us to shift our mind, to change our mind. But one of the first things I think we have to do to change our thinking and change our minds is to get our minds out out of the gutter, if you will. I, I think that sometimes we just, we just let slide by the notion that we can constantly worry, be thinking negative thoughts, be critical, be judgmental, have angry, resentful thoughts, and then think the world will change. If I just get angry enough and think angry enough thoughts at people, it'll all change. It doesn't work like this. And a huge part of what we have to do is begin to delve into deeper changes and watch our thoughts happen so we can catch them as an observer and make changes. 
So there's some things to watch for. I, I noticed that uh, when I was in high school, I got decent grades. I was in the honor society because I got a lot of A's in things like choir and social studies and English, not so much in math. But there was one class I got a really good grade in and it really surprised me, and it was logic class. I went to logic class and the, the teacher gave us all these logic problems that we had to go through and solve and find fallacies. And I worked really hard and I went to him one day on this big, huge problem he gave to us. And I presented it back to him. It was a baseball thing, actually. And I presented back to him and said, there's a fallacy in this problem. It can't be solved. And he took the book and he looked at it for days and he came back a few days later and he said, Michelle Madrano was absolutely right. I have been teaching this class and presenting this problem for 30 years and no one's ever pointed that out to me. And he gave me an A and said I didn't have to come back to class anymore. <laughs> so I didn't. Seems logical to me. <laughs> so I, I was so surprised, but I remember some elements that really took me about that. And it was, it was partly because I was in this teaching, but there are some key things to watch for that I think are becoming the bane of our society and our culture and our world right now that are keeping us from growing better gardens. And they are sweeping generalizations. Most sweeping generalizations have extreme fallacies in them. Sweeping generalizations are when we say things like always and never. My husband never. My kids always. Those people over there in that country never. That political party always. That religion never. All those words, I would bet, according to my logic class, about 85% of the time, fallacies up the wazoo, I'll tell you. Not true. But we think from them and we project them all over each other in anger and frustration. And then we find ourselves growing these weeds that are strange looking weeds that outpicture themselves. And we wonder why we can't find peace. Peace lives in the center. Sometimes people do that. Sometimes people do that. Sometimes they don't. But I'll tell you, violence, war, tyranny starts with people who say, always, never. So we ourselves have to be willing to stand in that space of grace as we perceive ourselves because we do the same to ourselves, don't we? I never get a break. I always have to work so hard. No one ever loves me. Those kinds of broad sweeping generalizations from a logic perspective and from a spiritual health perspective, they don't serve us. So we get to watch ourselves thinking those thoughts and become willing to lovingly challenge ourselves. I love the work of Byron Katie, and I have been lately asking myself a lot about my own thoughts, stopping myself mid-sentence and saying, is that true? Can I prove that that's true? That all people over there believe blah? And usually I can't prove it's true. So therefore I can't stand in it. I can't be with it. And so we've got to be willing to do that. Now, negative town, anger town, frustration town is a town we go through in our human journey. And, and we don't have a teaching that says we never go there. We're not a teaching that denies that sometimes things don't go our way or our life isn't the way we want it and we get frustrated. But we have to see those towns, and I got this example from you, Mom, the other day. We have to see those towns as towns we're going through. If I'm heading to Los Angeles, I might choose to go through Grand Junction. But Grand Junction is not my ultimate goal. Not that there's anything wrong with Grand Junction. All you Grand Junction people, we love you out there. But if that's not my ultimate goal, if my ultimate goal is not to live in anger and frustration, why would I stop there for years and camp out? I keep my intention to keep moving and to understand that I'm moving through and that any time I'm triggered by something out there, I have to look here. 
Practitioner Ken Ludwig posted a great story, one of my favorites, from great, the great teacher Thich Nhat Hanh, who passed away recently. And Thich Nhat Hanh talks about a, a monk who left his monastery uh, to go meditate in the middle of a lake one day. And he's in his boat meditating peacefully for hours, in the silence, just floating. And all of a sudden, another boat bangs into his boat. And he feels this anger rise up in him. And he opens his eyes because he's going to give that other boat person what for. And he realizes that boat is empty. It just floated into him. And the story says that at that moment, the monk achieves self-realization and understands that anger is within him. It simply needs to hit an external object to provoke it. After that, whenever he met someone who irritated or provoked his anger, he remembered the other person is just an empty boat. Anger is inside me. A joyful story to remember and almost bless those who provoke anger in us or frustration. To say, ah, there's something in me that wants to be smooth and easy and I get to look at that. Now, I want to speak about the mind also today, not only from that emotional place, but from an acknowledgement and recognition of trauma response. Because a lot of us have minds that have experienced trauma. And most of the time, we know that trauma happens when people have an extreme experience of pain or anguish, abuse, violence, uh, something that just completely discombobulates them, and that the, the effect of that can often be depression, anxiety, uh, PTSD with dreams and memories that happen. I know that in these last few years with so many deaths, I've experienced PTSD quite frequently from some of those experiences. And what I'm here to say today is that while most of us have put people who have trauma possibly over in another part of the garden and said, well, all those people with trauma, they're over there. What I want to say is that we've all been through a lot of trauma the last few years. We've been sent to our rooms. We've missed connecting with people We've watched, as the news, as Barry points out, 24-7 points out to us about people passing away and heard the stories or maybe lost loved ones ourselves, felt the loss of our life, felt the loss of connection. And I think that we all get to face that we may have a little trauma brain going on ourselves and that that's okay. I love what is being said a lot in the world right now. It's okay to not be okay. But we here want to provide tools, not only here on Sundays and in our classes, but to bring workshops forward of people who can specifically help us. And that's why we're bringing Nick Lawrence next week, a religious scientist who has knowledge about holistic brain and the ability to transcend trauma so that we can be in better relationship with others. And even if you don't choose to participate in the workshop, I encourage all of us to consider and give ourselves a break around our minds to set the intention for healing, but to understand that we may be having a bit of a collective or individual trauma response and that it's okay and that there is help. There's help in the world. There's help in this church. And sometimes we need help to be able to have a healthy, clearer mind and that there's no shame in getting help to allow our minds to relax and calm down. And the last thing I want to share is that a few weeks ago, I was home flipping through channels, and last week, Josh mentioned that he did a talk that was bringing Jesus in July. I'm going to bring Santa into July, because I confess I was watching Miracle on 34th Street, <laughs> the original one in black and white with Natalie Wood. And there's this scene where Santa is in, in Susie's room talking with her, trying to help her believe in him. And she's being very logical. And he says, well, haven't you ever been to imagination? And he talks about that as a nation that is a place that you can go. 
And I'm wondering if we would be willing to pay attention to what we've been pledging our allegiance to. Have we continued to pledge our allegiance to anger and pain and suffering and not doing anything about it? And would we be willing to pledge our allegiance to imagination? And this reminded me that growing up, every day in elementary school at least, I said the Pledge of Allegiance, and it's, it's absolutely incorporated into my being. I can stand here and say it, and it's, it's influenced my thinking, it has had a place in my life, and I wondered if I would be willing to pledge allegiance to possibility thinking. Because that's the other thing I think we get to face right now, with the challenges that are going on in our world. We need better imaginations. We need to think outside the box. We need to come up with solutions that are, have never been thought of before. And when I say we, I mean maybe some of us will do it, but maybe some of us who aren't even in this room will do it. But we together can have a vision for a greater world and a greater life for ourselves if we begin to use the mind that we have to imagine to imagine a new world, to imagine ourselves being in Los Angeles, to imagine ourselves being where we really want to be. And I invite us to pledge our allegiance to that nation in our life. And in fact, I sort of rewrote the Pledge of Allegiance. And I'd like to close with my allegiance to imagination. And you can say it with me if you want. I put it on my Facebook for any of you who might want it. It's on my personal page. Here's how it goes. You can put your hand over your heart too if you like. I pledge allegiance to my imagination, to the possibilities of life, and to the ideas for which I stand, co-creativity in God, lifting me into greater freedom at all times. And so it is. Yeah. So as we close our time out, I invite us to pray together and invite our wonderful practitioner prayer partners to stand with us. Our prayerful time is a time to pledge allegiance, to spend time in practice, is to allow ourselves to deepen into the mind that God is as us, to meditate, to pray, is to allow a higher idea to inspire and uplift us. And that's why when we pray, we begin with the notion that God is all there is. That the infinite power and presence that is all through all, in all, as all, everywhere present. And it's right here, right now, in, through, as each one of us. That we are in the mind that God is. We are that mind expressed. And as we do this, as we know this, as we claim this together, we stand as witness to the, the good that our garden is. We choose to grow a garden of power and light and love that contributes to the gardens of every being everywhere in a powerful way to be a contribution that uplifts and supports and sustains a life of possibility, not only for ourselves, but for every every being on this planet. We choose to contribute to a life that is profound and joy-filled, that is full of solutions and possibilities, that's full of love and peace. And we surrender into this awareness right here and right now with great love and joy. And as we do this, we just give thanks and we release this prayer into the action of that law that makes it so. Letting it go, letting it be and saying together, and so it is, amen.